power, action, drama. That's the way the Gospel of Mark reads, according to our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and today our study of Mark continues in chapter 13 with the Olivet Discourse. Now, we already studied this event in the book of Matthew a few months ago, but today we'll see it a little differently through the eyes of Peter as recorded by his spiritual son, Mark. Dr. McGee has told you Matthew was written to Israel for the religious man, and Mark was written for the Romans, or what he refers to as the strong man. So while the stories are the same, we'll see a bit different emphasis. It's an interesting study, so go ahead and grab your Bible, and while you do, I want to share a few letters from listeners of our Through the Bible program, this time in the Middle East. This first is from Saeed, who texted to say, Hello, I'm Muslim. I've been listening to your radio program. Can you send me a Bible? I don't know where else to get a copy. They are not available in many places. Jesus has been in my thoughts for a long time. I want to know him more. Well, isn't that great? And we're doing a bunch of different things to make sure that guys like Saeed get copies of the teaching as well as the Bible on their smartphones. More about that to come. Now, here's another letter. This is from uh, Fasil in Jordan. My life has been changing in a great way since I started listening to Arabic through the Bible. I have committed my daily night time to learn the Word of God through you. The way you explain the Scripture and help us understand how to apply it to our daily lives keeps me on track. Pray for me. I am praying for this great ministry. And then finally, here's actually a social media post from Abed in Yemen. I've been following your program for less than a month, and I want to learn more about your book and your religion. I never knew that Jesus, Isa, has done all this for me or us. Since I found your program, I know something different is growing in me. I want to be a Christian, but don't know how. Well, if you'd like to join us in praying specifically for listeners like these in the Middle East and all over the world, and for those on our team that answer those phone calls and texts and emails, then you need to sign up for our World Prayer Team today. Go to ttb.org forward slash pray. Do it before the end of the day. And if God's using our studies in his word to teach you something new or maybe change your heart as you seek to follow him, you know we'd love to hear your story. You can always email it. Again, it's really easy, biblebus at ttb.org. You can also write to us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Let's pray together as we begin our study. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that tells us what we can expect in the days to come and help us to hear the message that you have for us so that instead of living in fear and anxiety, so much a part of this world today, we can enjoy and anticipate the return of Jesus Christ. In his amazing name we pray, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today, friends, as we come here to this 13th chapter, of the Gospel of Mark. Again, I want to repeat that Mark's account here is one of action. We've emphasized that with the emphasis upon miracles. The last chapter, we saw that there weren't many, but there was action. Now we come to this chapter, and there's no miracles, but there's a great deal of action. But it's future action, you see. The action hasn't come to a standstill. There's more action here than any preceding chapter, but it's in the future. This chapter records the eschatological events which will end this age, and the catastrophic events of the Great Tribulation are given, and the second coming of Christ is graphically described. And my friend, this is action geared to divine power, and that's greater than atomic power, by the way. Now, we'll notice as we go through this chapter, and it actually is not as long as some others that we've had, that we will call attention to some of the things we've had before, because the Olivet Discourse that's given in Mark is much briefer than the one given in Matthew. In fact, this is an abridged edition. It's a truncated edition. That's been true of Mark all the way through, except in some notable instances where he gives the longest account of certain things than any other gospel. But his policy is to abbreviate everything. And here we have that brought out. Now you have in this chapter, and we have majored on alliteration, 
So here we go. In the first four verses, we have the presentation of questions by the disciples to Jesus on top of the Mount of Olives. Verses 5 and 7, panorama of this age. And then verses 8 through 13, we have persecution preceding the great tribulation. Then verses 14 to 23, prophecy of the great tribulation. Verses 24, 27, proclamation of the second coming of Christ. Verses 28 to 33, parable of the fig tree. And verses 34 to 37, program for God's people. Now that's a lot of peas in that pod, wouldn't you think? And so that's what we have in this chapter here. Now let's look at this, and I'm reading verse 1. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. Now I think that this is an illustration of how misunderstandings can arise in putting together gospel records or passages of Scripture. Actually, the question arises here immediately, what's back of all of this? Why did they say this? Well, actually, you'd have to go to Matthew to find that out. We've been through Matthew, so let me just make a passing reference to it. He pronounced a coming desolation upon the temple, and the disciples were puzzled because there was a grandeur and glory about that temple and the surrounding buildings, and they wanted to make sure that he'd noted it. They said, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he asked them the question. They say to him, do you see these buildings? They want to make sure that he had missed it. And now he says to them, do you really see them? And this is a great truth, by the way, and a great spiritual lesson is here. Here in downtown Los Angeles, just in the past few years, there's gone up a 40-story building, 42-story. Right across the way in a block and a half, two 50-story buildings, and catacorned across the street, a 60-story building. And down the street, the greatest downtown shopping area in America. Several skyscrapers there, a big shopping mall, a great department store, two hotels. My friend, I want to tell you, you could ask that question today. Don't you see all these buildings? But the question is, do we really see these buildings? We see their beauty, we see their strength, their stability, and their permanence. Looks to me like they're here for a long time, unless we have a good earthquake or a bad earthquake, so into how you look at it, and that may determine that they'll come down. But actually, all these buildings are temporary, and they're passing away. A true perspective would allow us to see that not one stone is going to be left upon another, only they didn't build them of stone, mostly concrete and steel, but it's all coming down. Paul stated this great spiritual truth in 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. My friend, that is a great truth. Did you know that Nebuchadnezzar walked through great Babylon in his day, and there was a glory about Babylon, and as he walked through it, he says, is not this great Babylon that I've built? Have you ever seen a picture of the ruins of it? Nothing to brag about there. It's all gone, friends. The glory has disappeared. And around us here today in Los Angeles, skyscrapers going up. They're coming down too, by the way, because he says they're going to come down. These things are passing away. Do we really see the things today that are eternal? Now, let me move on. That is a great spiritual truth that is there. Verse 3, chapter 13 of Mark, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, 
over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew ask him privately. Now, Mark is always putting in a little something that we don't get elsewhere. Now, I didn't know it was these four men who actually were the delegation or the committee that waited on him with the question. But here they are. And we have said before, this is Peter's gospel. So Peter lets Mark know that it was Peter and James and John and Andrew. They ask him privately, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And these are the only two questions that Mark has, but Matthew has the full questions, three of them. And Dr. Luke answers part of it. That is, when will one stone not be left on another? But the other two questions, what's the sign of the end of the age? And what is the sign of the coming of Christ? Then both Mark and Matthew have that. Now, Matthew has it in a great deal more detail than we have it here. But we'll look at Mark's emphasis. Now, you must remember he's writing to the Romans, and he's going to call attention to that which reveals power, action, and that which is dramatic. And friends, there's a great deal of all of that right here. Now, let me read beginning now at verse 5. And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. And that is the constant warning, a warning against false Christ. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, the warning against false Christ, somebody says, well, that's not pertinent today, is it? I think it's very pertinent right now. You know, there is a danger, and I didn't know just how to emphasize that, but it's a grave danger of being deceived right now about a false Christ. Somebody said, you don't mean it. I certainly do. Some may think that they're immune to this danger. Some of you are listening to me. Let me say this to you. Did you know that the Christ of liberalism today is an antichrist? Not the real Christ. You say, well, I thought they preached the Christ of the Bible. Oh, no, they don't. May I say to you, look at this for a moment. According to their statements, he was not virgin born. He never performed a miracle. He did not shed his blood on the cross for the sins of the world. He was not raised bodily from the grave. He did not ascend bodily into heaven, and he's not coming again bodily. May I say to you, the Jesus they preach, is that kind of Jesus. And do you know that there's no Jesus like that in the Bible? The one in the Bible, why, he was virgin born. <laughs> he performed miracles. He shed his blood for the sins of the world. He was raised bodily from the grave. He ascended into heaven. He's coming again. Now, that's what the Bible says. And the Bible, which contains the only documents of a historical nature concerning him, claims all these great cardinal facts of the faith. Evidently, the liberal is talking about another Christ, another Jesus. And any other Christ, friends, is Antichrist. Listen to John in 1 John 2, 18. Little children, it's the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it's the last time. There are a lot of antichrists. This is one of them I've called your attention to, and there are a lot of phonies around today that are claiming to be Christ. I understand that a founder of a religion here in Southern California is claiming today that he can do what Christ could not do. One of the Beatles claimed that they were more popular than Christ and that they were able to do more than he was able to do for today. There are a lot of antichrists around. Our Lord did well to warn us about that. Now in verse 7, he says, And when you shall hear wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. Now, I think wars like false Christ characterize the whole age. And no believer should be disturbed by wars, and wars are not the sign of the end of the age. Neither Antichrist nor wars indicate that we're at the end of the age. And when I say Antichrist, 
I mean all of these false antichrists. Now they'll finally come the antichrist. All of these are pointing to him, of course. Now, in verse 8, and I continue to read, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in divers places. There shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrow. Isn't it interesting in this day when man feels he's so civilized and he has so many gadgets and he's making the world such a wonderful place, all of a sudden he's discovered that he's polluting the world, that he's going to make it uninhabitable, and that before long, unless he cuts down the population explosion, he's going to starve to death. That's what the Bible says, friend, that would characterize it. It's interesting that this book that men have despised has been so accurate about it. A few years ago, they thought science would solve the problems of the world. It's made problems now that neither science nor the world can solve at all. Even Bernard Shaw had to say, the science to which I pin my faith has failed me. And now he says you are beholding an atheist who has lost his faith. Oh my, how tragic for an atheist to lose his faith. May I say to you, these are the things that characterize the age. Now, verse 9, he says, But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils. Now, I don't think he's talking about the church here. And in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. Now, what gospel? The gospel of the grace of God? Yes, it's grace, all right, but it's the gospel of the kingdom. And it doesn't mean there are two gospels as we saw that. It was labeled. Our Lord labeled it in the Olivet Discourse, and I think that he must have gone over this. I think in any gospel, you have only a brief account. There's no gospel writer attempt to give us a biography or to cover all of the details of any incident that they are recording. Each one is doing it for a purpose. Now, it's the gospel of the kingdom. That's a facet of the same gospel that we preach today with this distinction. will be salvation by the grace of God. And God's never had but one way to save sinners, but by the death of Christ. But very frankly, the emphasis will be here, repent, he's coming. And when they say it in that day, it'll be in the great tribulation period, it'll be accurate, friend. Now, notice this, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now, this is no verse for a lazy preacher to use for not preparing a sermon. And I have met the brethren that have said that they use this. I remember a friend of mine down in Texas told me that he was at Temple, Texas one morning waiting. He'd changed trains there, and he was going out to a little town to preach. And there was a man there with a long Prince Albert coat, and he kept eyeing him. And finally, this man came over and said to him, are you a preacher? And he said, yes. And he was walking up and down, going over his notes for his sermon. He says, what you doing? He says, I'm going over my notes for my sermon. He says, you mean that you prepare your sermon beforehand? And this man said, well, don't you? And the man said, no, I don't. And he said, I wait till I get up there, and the Spirit of God gives me the message and this man said to him, well, says, suppose that the Spirit of God doesn't give you the message immediately when you get up. What do you do? Oh, he says, I just mess around till he does. There's been a whole lot of messing around today, friends. This is not for that. This is in that day when the 144,000 of the nation Israel are witnesses. This is a message for them in that day. This is not an excuse for you and me not to prepare our Sunday school lesson. Now, will you notice? We find here that there will be betrayal. We've seen that before. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. And that's anti-Semitism worldwide. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. We've seen that that means that when he puts his seal upon them in that day, they're going to make it through to the end. Now, will you notice, 
Here is the dramatic part. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation. We've seen that before. That is the beginning of the great tribulation. The first three and a half years of it, comparatively quiet. False peace of the Antichrist. Now, in the midst of it, there appears this abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, that is, in the holy place. Let him that readeth understand, let them that be in Judea flee to the mountain. Now, don't you see if Mark had said to the Romans, abomination of desolation would stand in the holy place? Well, they'd say, well, where is the holy place? But he says, standing where it shouldn't stand. That's what it should be, of course. And that's more understandable to us today. That is, to a great many of us, we don't understand that the holy place was only given to the nation Israel, and it was a place on the earth. The church hasn't any holy place. Now, and let him that's in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment, but woe to them that are with child, to them that give suck in those days. Now, this is the beginning of the great tribulation. Pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, for in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, neither shall be. You see, this is an intense spirit. Now, we went over this before. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christ and false prophets shall arise. Now, he gives the sign of his coming. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars of heaven shall fall, the powers that are in the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And those clouds are not rain clouds up there. They are the glory clouds, that Shekinah glory. And I believe that was the sign of the Son of Man in heaven as we indicated in Matthew. And verse 27, Then shall he send his angels, shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. This is not the rapture of the church. He doesn't send angels then to gather them because they're caught up to meet the Lord in the air then. Now the fig tree, as we've seen before, speaks of the nation Israel. Now I recognize this disagreement there, and I don't mind these folk disagreeing with us here, thinking that the fig tree is something else. But I personally believe that there's good scripture to make it very clear. After all, the nation Israel is God's timepiece. When you look at the fig tree, he says, now when you look at God's timepiece, it's not G-R-U-N, not B-U-L-O-V-A, not something else, but it's Israel, I-S-R-A-E-L. That is the thing that he's saying here. Now there to watch. Verse 34, for the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house, gave authority to his servants, to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Notice what he says, watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, even at midnight, cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, Watch, and that's for you and me today. But the watching is different. Have you ever noticed that watching is very different? You can watch in anxiety. You can watch in fear. But the child of God today is looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. And that's anticipation and joy. But in that day, there'll be great fear throughout the earth. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. You know, if you're fearful, maybe you've got anxiety about what lies ahead in the days to come, and you want to know more about how you can put your faith and trust in God, then visit our website, ttb.org. Just click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? There you'll find several free resources by Dr. McGee to read and listen to. And if you or someone you love needs reassurance that Jesus loves you, that he's not only holding open the door to your eternal life, but he's holding out the keys to give you his entire kingdom— I recommend you download our new digital booklet, The Most Important Question, Who is Jesus? 
It's based on a popular sermon by Dr. McGee in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19. And like everything else we make practically, it's available for free at ttb.org. Or if you need help finding it online, just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now, tomorrow the Bible bus rolls along in our study of Mark. I'm Steve Sweats, and as always, I'm holding the doors of the Bible bus open so you can hop aboard. Jesus made it grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, whom God uses to take the whole word to the whole world.